Well, I wanna once again welcome everyone and thank you for being part of our worshiping community here today. Uh, we marked another milestone this week on our way to spring in that here in New Brunswick, at least, we now officially have more hours of sunlight than we have hours of darkness. And, and that may not seem like a big thing, but I know for me, at least, I'm pretty encouraged by that. And as we think about spring, I also wanna just remind you that in a few weeks time, we'll also be celebrating Easter as a church family, when we can give special focus and attention to the sacrificial death of Jesus, and of course, his victory over the grave when he was raised to life. And so we hope you'll wanna join us for that. In fact, our focus is gonna start next Sunday, which is Palm Sunday, and it'll continue again uh, over the Easter weekend. But for today, we've got some unfinished business still left to do because for the past nine weeks, we've been doing a concentrated study of the book of First Peter together, the first of, of two letters that Peter wrote uh, near the end of his life that are found also near the back of the New Testament in the Bible. And, and so we've worked at it for nine weeks, but we're not quite done yet. We still have one more section to cover. And so if you're following along at home, we're gonna be using again, the New Living Translation of the Bible here. And, and today the place we're picking up this time is in chapter five and beginning at verse one. And as we do, let me just remind you, for those who've been with us for some or maybe all of our series so far, that Peter isn't a natural writer. It's not something he typically did. But he's writing this letter here in particular for a very specific reason, because of the fact that Christians during the time and place where he was living were struggling under the heavy hand of other established religious groups, as well as a government that saw any growing movement like theirs as a threat to peace and order. And so he wanted to write them just to encourage them that standing strong in their faith is what the Lord wants them to do. And that in fact, there's a blessing in store for those who do that. Literally back in chapter four, in verse 14, that we were looking at uh, not so very long ago in our series, it says, if you are insulted because, of, because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed for the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. That, and that's really been the message throughout his entire letter. But now here at the beginning of chapter five, Peter said a lot of what he's gonna say uh, in his letter. And so he's thinking about wrapping things up. But before he does, he wants to leave his readers with a few final words. He has a word to say specifically to church leaders and those who had, uh, had been part of the church for a while already. He has a second word, a much shorter word that he wants to leave with those who are younger and newer in the faith. And then the last word he has to share is to the whole church family together again. And so we're gonna just walk our way through this one group at a time. And, and there's a little bit we have to cover here. So, uh, you know, just buckle in with us for a little bit, but, but I think you're gonna find that this is kind of interesting. And for the first one, the first word that Peter wants to share in verse one, he says this, and now a word to you who are elders in the churches. This is a word to leaders. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ, Peter writes, and I too will share in his glory when he's revealed to the whole world. And so as a fellow elder, I, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. That's Peter's word to Christian leaders here, church leaders here, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. And of course, the imagery that he's using is one of shepherds caring for their sheep, which which is a pretty common theme in the Bible. And uh, it would have been very familiar in the place that the, uh, and the time that he was writing. Because the reality is that they had a lot of sheep back then. In fact, they still do. Uh, Peter specifically was writing to people living in Northern Asia Minor at the time, which is actually modern day Turkey. And to this day, I looked this up, Turkey is among the top 10 countries in the world in terms of sheep population. They have over 30 million animals. You know, it, it would be kind of cool if turkeys were the main livestock in Turkey, but apparently sheep still rule the day. And so when Peter suggests that elders should care for the flock that God has entrusted to them, their minds would have very easily pictured that field of sheep and the shepherds who took care of them. And you know, it's interesting because in, in biblical times, shepherds kind of stood out among the rest of the people who were living back then. And, and they were sort of known for two things, actually. The first one, and this isn't exactly a flattering thing to be known for, is that they were kind of looked on in a negative way as being dirty because the nature of their work was dirty. Like they basically lived with the sheep, which meant 
that they were outdoors a lot, they didn't always have access to water to bathe in or wash their clothes in and that kind of thing. And so people typically kept their distance from shepherds. Shepherds couldn't even attend religious gatherings because they were considered to be ceremonially unclean. But on the other hand, and this is the part of the reputation that Peter's kind of leaning into in his letter here, even though they were looked on as being dirty, interestingly, they were also known for being absolutely 100% fiercely loyal to the animals that were entrusted to them. To the point where, and this is kind of odd to say, but because shepherds spent a lot of time away from other people or people spent a lot of time away from them, they almost started to look on their flocks as their family. That's how close they became. And I say that's odd, but we, we probably all know people who have that kind of relationship with their own animals, don't we? You know, I was thinking again this week about someone that I know who has a small herd of cattle. And one of the things that I learned a few years ago about this woman and her cattle is that she can tell the difference between one cow and another by the sound of their voice. Like I was visiting there one day and, and a cow mooed and, and she was like, never mind, that's just Bessie talking as if it would matter to me which cow it was that was making all the noise. And so Peter says to the church leaders, he calls them elders, he says, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Care for them like family, like their well-being is the most important thing to you, especially their spiritual well-being. And then he mentions three things that should characterize the way they, share, they, they care for their church family. And by the way, when I think of our own church elders here and, and some of the other leaders that I have the blessing of working with on an ongoing basis, these are some of the qualities that I actually see in them. You should know this. We have great leaders here. Firstly, he says, watch over it. That is, watch over the flock or the church family willingly, not grudgingly. In other words, being a leader in the church, if you ever have the opportunity to serve in that capacity, should be something that actually brings joy into your life. Like it should be something you're happy to do. And if it doesn't bring you joy, or if it's something that you grow to resent, for some reason, then the truth is you probably should rethink it at that point, or at least revisit the motivations that are in your own heart. Because as a general rule, listen, resentment isn't typically a good catalyst for effective leadership. People don't lead well when they're unhappy doing it. And so Peter says to Christian leaders here, watch over the church family willingly, not grudgingly. Then secondly, he adds this, he says, Christian leaders should lead not for what you'll get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. In, in other words, a person should never take on a leadership role within a church family or, 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 uh, or, or within the Christian community for their own personal benefit, whatever that benefit is perceived to be. To make sure that God gets the glory is the goal. It's a call to humility, really. And then lastly, he says, don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, or don't become big-headed about your role either, but lead them by your own good example. Be respectful about it. And when the great shepherd appears, you'll receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. See, that's it. Do it willingly, do it sacrificially, and do it respectfully. Like I said, I, I see that in our own church family, and I can't help but think about how pleased God is with those who've answered the call to serve in the way in that way here. But that's the first group that Peter addresses, Christian elders or, or Christian leaders. Then he has this word to say to some of those who were younger and newer in the faith. In verse five, he says, in the same way, which is just to say in the same loyal way that leaders are to provide care for the Christian community, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. Now. Like, understand, Peter's not trying to create a power model here. That's why he says that he has to say, that says what he has to say to leaders first. He's very deliberate about that. It's all about servanthood, actually. But to those who aren't called to be leaders at this point, and actually, he's talking to younger, more inexperienced Christians directly here. What he's encouraging is for them to respect the people who are in those leadership roles. And by the way, that's not because they're always going to get it right all the time. But as those who are doing their part to lead, one of the things that is going to make them better leaders is when they have the confidence that they have the support and the prayer support and the encouragement of the church family 
all together. And so, so, so that together they can be the best collective witness for God and for God's good in the world that he's called us to live in for the sake of his kingdom. And if I can just speak personally as, as someone who's been in church leadership now for the better part of three decades, I will just say that in my own experience even, there have been some challenges that I've had to deal with along the way. And of course, that's to be expected because when it comes to the Lord's work, we actually have a personal enemy, the devil, who, who doesn't want us to succeed. We're gonna come back to him again in a bit. And so sometimes there are challenges Challenges from the outside, like come from the outside of the church. Challenges from inside the church, which are often more painful and difficult to deal with, typically. And then there are challenges that are internal and personal as well, that are kind of just born out of our own life circumstances, our, our own journey with God. And I don't want to paint the wrong picture here, because serving the Lord in leadership and church leadership is incredibly rewarding the vast majority of the time. It is a joy to be able to be used by God in service to others. But I can also say with some conviction actually, that there are days and seasons in ministry life when people who lead can become very acquainted with human frailty. And personally speaking, it is during those seasons that the thing that God has used perhaps more than anything else to keep me pushing through into the next season of fruitfulness and harvest are the timely words of encouragement and other demonstrations of support and togetherness in ministry that I've received along the way from those who are part of my own church family. And that's really the point Peter's making here, that the church is best served when we all demonstrate and, and love the support and love for one another, whatever role we serve in. And so that's the second word that he has to share. It's a word to those who are younger and newer in the faith. But I mentioned that he has a third uh, and final word as well. And so as, as he puts the finishing touches on his letter here, Peter, and, and is getting ready to seal it and send it off to the churches, Peter comes back around now to addressing the church as a whole. And as his final word, he actually wants to leave them with four parting thoughts. And in my mind, whenever someone has some parting thoughts that they want to share, that's a time to pay particular attention because it's like they're saying, you know, I, I don't want to, I have to go, but I don't want to leave you without knowing, without you knowing what uh, these few last things that I want to tell you about. And so for our purposes, we're going to just talk through these four things quickly, and then we're going to be through. In the second half of verse five, he says, and all of you, now again, this is all Christian believers. He's back to addressing the whole group. All of you dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Peter uses the imagery of putting on humility like you would put on clothing, as if it's something that's not really a natural part of our character, but rather something that we have to be very intentional about covering ourselves with. And he even makes a reference in the, uh, to a verse from the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, a, a saying of King Solomon's from over a, a thousand years earlier in Proverbs 3. It's a, a verse that actually gets a shout out a couple of times in the New Testament because the Apostle James mentions it in his letter too. The Lord mocks the mockers, but is gracious to the humble. Or as Peter words it here, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And keeping in mind that Peter is writing to a church of Christ, uh, of Christ followers who are trying to follow Jesus in a time and place that wasn't always friendly to the cause, what he was saying to them is that if they wanted to continue to serve God's kingdom well in an unfriendly environment, one of the ways that will make it easier for them to do it is if they maintain a humble attitude toward one another. I, I've mentioned this passage earlier in our series, but I'm going to mention it again in Philippians two, three, and four, the apostle Paul tells us, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. And so that's the first thing Peter says to us in closing, be humble. And then he goes on in verse seven to say, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. Which that's one of the hardest things to do as a Christian, isn't it? Because it's not like we typically invite worry into our lives. It just forces its way in and it doesn't like to leave once it gets there. And if I can just 
give you a little bit of friendly advice. It's not always helpful if you know somebody who is a worrier to just say to them, don't worry. Because, you know, sometimes we do that. Christians love to quote that verse from Philippians 4, 6 that says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. I mean, it's good advice. It's biblical. But for the person who's really struggling, it's not always the best thing to lead with. And I actually prefer Peter's approach here in the letter when he says to his readers who, who had legitimate worries that they were dealing with every day, remember, give all your worries to God. It's like he's saying, I know the worries are there uninvited. I know if you could let them go, you would let them go. So how about this? How about you at least share them? Share them with the Lord. Don't hold them so tightly. Share them with the one who cares for you and just see what happens after that. And so that's the second thing Peter tells us in closing. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Then thirdly this, verse 8, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him. Be strong in your faith. Friends, this is one of the most descriptive verses in the whole Bible when it comes to the way that our spiritual enemy, the devil, operates. That he prowls around like a lion waiting, you know, quietly, just out of sight until he has a clear opportunity to bring somebody down. And, and, I, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say a lot about this today. It, it's something that we might want to come back to in the future sometime, though, because it's important. But I do want to say this, that as followers of Jesus, we are never more vulnerable to a crisis of faith as we are when we begin to forget, neglect, underestimate, or begin to disbelieve in Satan as our personal enemy. And it happens. It can happen very easily, as a matter of fact. That's why Peter tells us to stay alert, stand firm, and be strong. And then lastly, and I know we've covered a lot of ground here today. We've done it quickly, but we're coming to an end with this. In verse 9, Peter makes this encouraging statement. He says, remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. You're not alone. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you've suffered a little while, he will restore, support, strengthen you, and will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Amen. And with that, he signs off this way. I've written and sent this short letter to you with the help of Silas, whom I commend you as a brother, a faithful brother. My purpose in writing is to encourage you, to assure you that what you're experiencing is truly a part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace. Your sister church here in Babylon, that's where he's writing from, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet each other with a kiss of love. Be, peace be with all of you who are in Christ. But again, the final encouraging statement he makes is for us to remember we're not alone. Listen, when you are going through a challenge and your faith is being strained and your resolve has been weakened and your will is being tested, be sure to keep this in mind. God's word is saying this to us today. You're not the first to go through that kind of suffering and you won't be the last. And the one who first suffered and died for us is the one who will ultimately give you the restoration, the support, and strength you need to come out victoriously on the other side, on firm and solid ground. Let's pray together as we close. Thank you, God, for this little letter that's been preserved for us now for, for nearly 2,000 years as part of your inspired word. And thank you for what we've been learning about living for you in the midst of challenges to our faith. Today, God, we choose you. We choose to live for you. And we love you because you first loved us and sent your son Jesus to die for us. And so we say with Peter here, as well as all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, all over the world in every generation, we say this today, all power to you forever. Amen. May God be with you. Thanks again for joining us. Bye for now.